All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining the ACA Small Business Bootcamp and Resource Collective for this Tuesday morning, June 30th. Uh, we're grateful to have you here with us. I want to first thank our community partners uh, for helping support the Bootcamp Collective, Bootcamp and Resource Collective, and their content and participation in the webinars. The ACA Small Business Bootcamp and Resource Collective is a uh, designed to help small businesses uh, work through and emerge from the COVID crisis stronger than ever. It's supported by our community partners and it is a daily boot camp through July um, with the recordings. Um, and you can find the recordings of the previous boot camps on our small business boot camp page and the future sessions you can register on that same page as well. Um, we have the information and tools provided by our community partners on our resource collective as well. And again, that can be accessed through our bootcamp page on, collecting, on selecting the resource collective. So this week, uh, we had a great session yesterday on business mapping tools where we talked about the business canvas model. Today, we've got uh, leading resilient teams virtually uh, with Joe from the University of Arizona. He is a professor over there. And, we are excited to have him with us today. Uh, tomorrow we have some small business success stories and we're gonna hear from three different businesses on how they overcame COVID-19 and how they're doing now. And then on Thursday, we have the IRS for some tax relief for small businesses. And then Friday, there is no session um, as it's the observed holiday for Independence Day. So just a, a big update, big reminder today, the PPP loan program ends today. Today is the last day uh, to get the loan number through the SBA. If you are still working with your lender on a PPP loan and you do not have the SBA loan number, you need to get that today. Um, your lender needs to get the information keyed into the SBA system today or you will not be able to get one. Um, the SBA portal will close tonight. Um, and so please stay on top of that. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and uh, we can answer that. Um, we want to talk real quick about some of the ACA programs, uh, small business services. We can help with local banking contacts, latest developments for COVID, uh, navigating through the SBA programs and working with the small business development centers. Our workforce division can help employers um, access the tools and resources available through Arizona at Work for finding employees and helping get them trained. And our Arizona MEP is our Manufacturing Extension Partnership and they can help support the manufacturers out there and, and help work with uh, developing plans to grow stronger and grow your business. A reminder for information on COVID-19, we have the Arizona Together, the state's ArizonaTogether.org website uh, for all information, COVID-19 and resources. Um, we also have our resources and guides links uh, in our resource collective and all these are different guides to help your business uh, regardless of the type, whether it's a barber shop or a contractor, a retail or a restaurant, um, anywhere in between we have, there's a guide to help you return to work and return to work stronger. Additionally, for all updates, uh, COVID-19 related and essentially business updates as well, uh, you can find those on our COVID-19 business resource page at the, on our azcommerce.com. So today as speaker is Joe Corella. Uh, he's a professor of global strategy and assistant dean for executive education at the Eller College of Management at the University of Arizona. Uh, we are real excited to have him here today. and He's got a great presentation. So I am going to Turn the time over to Joe. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Joe is going to share his. Hello. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Yes, I hear you. Bring up my voice just to make sure I have a resilient voice for the duration of this podcast, uh, this webcast. I'm also going to share my video. Can you see me okay? Yep. Excellent. Well, welcome everyone. I am going to take a, just a minute to pick my slides up from where I left them. Uh, here we go. 
And Joe, one thing I forgot to mention to everybody, please, we, uh, through Joe's presentation, he's gonna ask to use the, the chat for a few things and then also the question and answer at the bottom of your screen. So we're gonna, it's gonna be, there's gonna be some interaction. Um, so please feel free to use the chat box and the Q&A. Uh, there'll be questions we're gonna, he's gonna ask throughout the, the presentation. So um, we can answer those as we go. Um, so keep an eye out for those. Yes, please. And uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you to the ACA for uh, putting all of this work together. We're really excited to be a part of this and to help uh, the uh, local community. Uh, one thing for those on the call that are interested in, uh, we have a variety also of resources on uh, our LR Executive Education website that are free to you. Uh, so feel free to uh, take a look at our website. And I may ask you a favor at the end of this because I'm uh, running a little study and I may ask you to participate in my little study. But first of all, let's talk about um, how you've coped with the change. Before we get into what resilience is about and uh, how you make your virtual teams uh, more resilient, I'm gonna ask you if you could tell me how you coped with the change when it comes to your teams. Um, how uh, they have embraced versus not embraced working virtually, what has worked, what didn't um, in your experience. So if you can uh, uh, chime in and put something in uh, the chat, um, I would love to see what, um, what you have to say. And I will also share what I've heard from the local community, but first I would like to see some of your responses. Personally, doing fine. Nancy saying some coworkers have not. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nancy, I think um, uh, several of us are in the same boat. We are um, naturally more resilient than others are. Um, and there is a number of reasons behind it, uh, right? Um, much of it has to do with uh, how we uh, are wired personally and what motivates us. Uh, some of it has to do with the set of circumstances that we are and the hand that we're dealt with, uh, given that the pandemic is, uh, is difficult, is really difficult to, uh, to predict. Um, if anyone else would like to, to chime in um, and uh, get your thoughts in, that's, uh, that's appreciated. What I will share with you is that um, before the coronavirus um, started in December, I conducted a survey of about 200 executives in a variety of companies, both in the US and outside of the US. Um, they found that, uh, and it was specifically about working in teams across uh, geographies. It was uh, really, uh, how do you manage teams when, uh, when you're in a remote environment, different time zones? And 76% uh, of those individuals actually we're saying that uh, the, um, they had difficulty feeling connected to their teammates um, and the range of reasons that they were offering were uh, perceived differences in uh, personality and uh, the strain of working across time zones, for example, uh, the fact that they could not really work on things at the same time, that sometimes they had to wait for others and that there wasn't the immediacy of being able to go to uh, to their colleagues uh, at the next desk and ask them a question and see if they could move things along. Um, during the pandemic, uh, we actually reached out to them again and we asked them what had changed and what made things better or worse. And one thing that was pretty apparent was that things were amplified. And so the pandemic has essentially heightened uh, some of the both the functions and the dysfunctions of working in, uh, uh, in groups in, uh, in virtual settings. Um, Rogelio is saying that uh, they follow up with daily email reports and set individual schedule to get things done at the office. Uh, very interesting point, Rogelio, and we'll talk about discipline a little bit because that's an important component of, uh, of virtual teams. What we are seeing is that, and so going back to that survey of the 200 executives, one of the things that we're seeing is that um, in this rapidly evolving context, um, many of, um, of those individuals find that their priorities are shifting 
and that uh, they kind of go in and out of their traditional teams. I, you get asked to do new things that you haven't done before, or you get asked to work with people that haven't worked before, <clears throat> or as it happens, some of your colleagues become, for example, uh, more of a essential team, more of the key team than maybe say, say others who are uh, not seen as essential. Um, think of it from the perspective of, uh, say, facilities management, IT support, all of a sudden, you know, if we don't have uh, that kind of support, we're screwed. And so it's important that, um, uh, that we have those uh, colleagues be uh, kind of our backbone and that uh, we had to help them along the way. So that means reshuffling things. So fundamentally reshuffling things. And one of the things that I want you to take from this, this presentation today, if there is one thing that I'd like you to take, is that our brain is lazy. Um, I know that for some of you, this will seem like a little bit of a joke, right? Uh, what is he talking about? My brain is lazy. I'm working on a million things. Well, your brain is fundamentally lazy in the way in which it approaches things. And the fact that our brain likes the comfort of things that get done again and again and again. So what we do, what, the way that our brain works is that it likes to have <clears throat> repeated routines. It likes to create neural pathways and to follow those neural pathways without you having to spend energy. So the real point behind it is that using our brain requires a lot of energy. And because of that, our brain likes to preserve energy, likes being lazy, and likes for you to repeat things again and again. Now, fast forward to the uh, coronavirus and uh, think through how much our change, uh, the change around us has forced us to use the brain more actively. Things that our brain likes to do is to forget what, um, what we're doing and to just do it on autopilot. <clears throat> I'm sure that many of you can relate to that if you think of your drive uh, to and from work. How many times do we kind of zone out, uh, as we call it, and forget that we even got to the office? That's what our brain likes to do. Our brain likes to learn new things, and once it's learned, it wants to keep reusing them. So if you think of your virtual teams and if you think of the way in which we have to um, shift priorities all the time, change things along the way, it's really hard and our brain doesn't like to do it. So I'm going to uh, kind of uh, show you a little video and, uh, um, um, and um, kind of see your, uh, what your thoughts are on the video. So give me one second because I need to make sure that I share my computer sound and tell me what you see. So in the chat, please write down and tell me what you see. I'll play it one more time, just so that you can see what's going on. All right, in the chat, please tell me what you saw. Crash testing. That's interesting, Robert. Anyone else? Car crash, Raymond is saying a car crash. Yeah, we saw a car crash, right? And um, sure, in, uh, in the context of, um, of the um, uh, auto passing another one and crashed into a third, yes, Nancy, thank you. So essentially, we've seen a scene that uh, has been used in a um, experiment, experiment back in the 1970s in the UK where essentially a group of students um, was asked to uh, provide a perspective on what they actually had seen. But each group of students, uh, uh, the, the students were divided into small groups and each subgroup was asked the same question in a slightly different way. And I'm gonna uh, forward to the next, give me one second, forward to the next slide 
to essentially share with you um, what, uh, what ended up happening after they had seen the video. Like I said, uh, the group of students was divided into uh, different groups. And if you look at the graph to the left, each group of students was asked the question in a slightly different way. And they were asked, for example, at what speed did the car smash into each other in the video that you watched? And then there were a different group of students was asked at what speed did they collide into each other? At what speed they bumped into each other? Um, at what speed did they hit one another? Et cetera, et cetera. So you see that different terminologies were used. And because our brain has specific schemas and scripts on what each one of those words mean, different group of students responded that the speed at which the cars were going to, uh, to um, was different uh, according to the, the verb that was being used. So the way in which our brain works and the way in which we're influenced is very much dependent on the circumstances, on the language that's being used. And uh, um, fast forward a week later, um, in fact, before I, I ask you that, I'd like you to tell me again in the chat, if you don't mind, whether you actually saw broken glass or not in the video that I shared. If a couple of you would volunteer and uh, just type, did you see broken glass, yes or no? You heard it, Raymond heard it. And uh, I'm asking if you saw it. <laughs> uh, Rogelio did not see it. Uh, Liz saw it. Thank you, Liz. Nancy, no idea. Raymond, no. Uh, Mark, no, did not see it. Well, um, whether you saw it or not, first of all, I'll come out and tell you uh, right away that you did not see it. There was no way that you could see it because of the angle at which the camera was taken. But if you were one of the group of students that was asked whether the car smashed into each other or whether the car hit one another, you were more likely to have seen the broken glass than you had not. So the language that we use, the schemas and scripts that we use very much influence how we think about things. And just for the sake of uh, running another little experiment with this group, um, it applies to both our memory as well as what we see. It's not just a question of what words are being used, but also what we see. And uh, the reason why I bring this up, all of it, it's because when we are in virtual teams, we have even more separation from others and interpreting what others are saying, engaging others becomes all the more complicated. So uh, indulge me for uh, one more uh, little exercise. If you take a look at the checkerboard and you see the, um, um, the um, two uh, checks on the checkerboard that are marked with A and B, do you, uh, would you say that they are two different colors? Yes or no? Again, just like we did with the car. Liz says yes, absolutely. So says Raymond, so says Marie. Absolutely, we're all seeing them as two very different colors. Well, your brain is tricking you. Nancy, I like how you're being um, kind of a little bit of a politician there with two shades of gray. <laughs> they are two shades of gray, but they are two different shades of gray, right? If I have to push you on giving me an answer, I want, to, I want you to tell me whether they are two different shades or not. Yes, to me they are. A and B are two different shades. And yet our brain is making assumptions here in the sense that because our brain likes to think that this is a checkerboard and therefore one check has to be, uh, Mark is being, uh, um, is, uh, is kind of learning from all these experiments that I'm running and he does not believe his eyes uh, by saying that A and B are the same colors. Because our brain likes to see a check as a sequence of uh, lightly colored, darker colored um, uh, a pattern, and because we also have a cylinder on the checkerboard, we are compensating. <laughs> Robert, you're, uh, you're getting sneaky there. Yes, the letters are the same color. I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, move from the suspense and tell you what is actually going on. 
The two boards are exactly the same, the one that I'm sharing to the right now. Um, and yet, if you look at the two boards, now that I've put a uh, reference stick, two reference sticks, you can tell that they are the same, but at the same time, when you focus on B a little bit more, you kind of uh, see the contrast. What is going on is that because there's a, a cylinder on the, on the board, because our brain says that the two have to be, uh, the two checks have to be of different colors to follow the sequence, we assume where our brain is making assumptions is forcing us again it's being lazy and it's forcing us to uh, think through um, things with usual patterns when in fact things are slightly different and if our brain does this in an environment that is as straightforward as a checkerboard with a cylinder on top can you imagine how many assumptions our brain makes when we are dealing with a lot of complexity? The complexity, for example, of the coronavirus, of uh, COVID-19 that we're facing right now. It's a whole different uh, game and something that we need to be aware of. Some people at this point don't trust that I'm sharing the right information and that I am tricking you into thinking that checkerboard, uh, that the two checkerboards are different. So what I like to do is to move one of the reference sticks over onto the other side so that you can see that your brain is still tricking you and that I'm not tricking you. It's not me tricking you, it's your brain that is tricking you. So let's talk about what matters to teams resilience, given that we are um, here to talk about that. Um, all of this was really to say that when it comes to team resilience, all of those components that I was discussing before, the schemas, the scripts, the structures, the way in which we look at the world, the way in which we structure it, uh, our biases, which we all bring, and uh, the fact that we live in communities and that we have biases, they have biases, all of this matters to your team resilience in a uh, virtual environment. How so? Let's explore it. In a, when it comes to the structures, when you're thinking about your team's resilience and your ability for the team to really plow through uh, what is a really difficult situation. When I was first asked to, um, uh, to uh, come up with this talk, uh, the idea was uh, about returning stronger. Considering where we are at in, uh, in Arizona, I tweaked things a little bit because some of you may be at a point when you can return stronger, some of you may not. And some of you may be looking at ways to manage the current environment. So the recommendations that I'm gonna be giving you are very much dependent on uh, where you're at and I'm trying to also take into account that some of you have larger organizations and smaller organizations so read through this uh, through the multiple lenses that you're in and think through how you can uh, you can use it so in uh, when it comes to the structures and when you think about the virtual environment given that we're all biased given that many of our structures are um, uh, we're established before the coronavirus came in and before things got really thrown out there. Uh, given that our brain is lazy, you really need to go back to some of the basics. And so things that I think you need to be thinking right now is uh, having healthy conversations with your colleagues. Uh, for example, on how the work environment is different from their usual environment. Um, we all have different issues that we're coping at uh, di different points. And some of us are more privileged because we may have more support at home. Uh, we may have a large family, for example, that helps with, uh, with coping with, uh, with things. Some of us are not. And so it's important, uh, it's imperative that you sit down with your team members and you have a conversation around what does your work environment look like now? And how is it different? Think of kids, for example, those that may have large families may be blessed because they have a good support network, but they may have a bunch of kids running around at all times and it's difficult to concentrate. 
uh, some people can't leave the house anymore because they may have someone who's uh, um, maybe in a critical condition and uh, really they cannot expose them to the virus. So they get a lot of deliveries and uh, they have to schedule their lives around some of these deliveries. Uh, some of us, for example, may have their uh, clock completely screwed by uh, the fact that they may have family members in other time zones. I do, for example, so sometimes I'm up late at night to check and see uh, how my family is doing in, uh, in Europe. So all of these factors really need to surface because unless you let them surface, you're going to be making assumptions and you're going to, remember the brain is lazy, you're going to be thinking that people run their work on the same structure with the same, um, uh, with the same kind of flow and format uh, than it was prior to the coronavirus. Be clear surface that out. And if you are the person that is being impacted, you suffering in silence is not gonna help you. So make sure that you're explicit about what's going on. Establish a system of clear and open communication. Are you allowing for people the opportunity to share successes, grievances, challenges in a way that it's productive? My experience so far has been that when I talk to, uh, to managers, they feel that there is so much uncertainty and so much challenge that they really wanna do triage. Well, if you're just doing triaging, if you're just trying to address uh, what's on the table, what's wrong uh, on the day, you're actually doing a disservice to yourself and your team because you're not allowing your brain to focus on the good stuff and all you're focusing on is the bad stuff. It's the stuff that's um, terrible, that's, uh, that's challenging, that it's hitting you there and then. And you're focusing your mind very much on the present and on the issues at hand, as opposed to either the larger challenges, uh, but also the opportunities that can come from the future. So creating the mental space for good conversations, conversations about uh, the future that are productive um, rewires your brain to think different. Um, it's not just me say, saying this, there's plenty of research that whenever we focus our brain on negativity, um, the more primitive parts of our brain kick in and uh, what you end up doing is getting into flight or fight mode and that creates a lot of uh, um, essentially what I would call stress hormones, anything that is, uh, that helps you in the fight in the moment, but that ultimately takes you away from being in balance with yourself and being focused and being optimistic and uh, as well as realistic. So all you end up doing is uh, just worrying. Set measurable benchmarks that work in a virtual environment. One of the things that many people are telling me they struggle with is that I can't see my colleagues at work. How do I know that they're collaborating? How do I know that they are engaging with one another? How do I know that they're solving uh, problems with uh, issues with clients? How do I know that they're selling? You have to reshift your mindset around this. And so what are ways in which you can still manage the work uh, still engage them in a way that it's productive, even if you cannot see them in uh, uh, th throughout the day, even if you don't have the physical connection that you had before. The last part is really critical. Uh, manage team membership. And a question that I'm gonna ask you is, is being on multiple teams creating untenable dif difficulties for some individuals? And maybe for you too. I find that because we're having to um, work on so many different projects and uh, having to be on uh, multiple committees just because everyone has uh, FOMO, the fear of missing out, given that we are again in this uh, uh, distance environment and you're not really seeing what's going on, I think we are uh, making more difficulties for ourselves by forcing us and others into being involved into multiple teams at any one time, when in fact, maybe what's really important is to focus on what's essential and to make sure that people have 
clarity around roles and responsibilities, especially at this time. And in fact, in that research that I was mentioning earlier about managing multiple teams, one of the things that was clearly apparent was that increasingly uh, teams are becoming unclear on what their roles are required and their leaders are not telling them enough of uh, what they're supposed to be doing. So being clear and telling people also what they don't need to be worrying about is just as helpful as telling them what they should be worrying about. On to the next slide. I mentioned biases. We all, we all have them. As, <laughs> as my little exercise proved, even in very basic things, we all bring biases to our world and the way in which we look at things. Don't get me wrong, biases can be helpful. Having a point of view is helpful. What is not helpful is when we're facing new situations and we are um, continuing to apply the same thinking that we've used before, hoping that we will get the result that we're hoping because we just wanna go back to how things were. I think it's safe to say we are not going back to how things were anytime soon. And so the shift that you need to be taking internally is avoiding the, I, would, I think I was being uh, fairly elegant there when I said that we are uh, reusing some of our uh, thinking patterns. It's essentially stop banging your head against the wall, hoping that you're gonna get a different result every time. But look, for example, at what biases you have and you own. So, here are the most common ones. I worked on this piece of research back in uh, 2010 um, uh, with uh, Professor Ovalo at the University of Sydney. And one of the things that, um, that was um, uh, interesting to us was that when people come together, they bring biases and form biases as groups. Um, the most common one that I'm sure you're all familiar with is the interest bias. It's all about me. It's all about, um, what I'm going to get out of the situation. And if you are struggling, I'm sorry, I'm not going to take care of it. That interest uh, about me bias applies to groups as well. And so one of the most common things that I've seen uh, uh, at times of the coronavirus is to immediately retrench to a position where uh, screw the suppliers, I just want the stuff when I want it, or um, I can't uh, listen to you right now. Um, we as a group have to retrench. We have to do what we have to do. Stop bugging me. Any of it is not really helpful if it's going to ultimately impact your decision making. Self-protection is right, but make sure that you balance that and that you're really thinking, am I always thinking about me? Am I thinking about my supply chain? Am I thinking about my community? What else am, what am I doing that may be impact to others? And what else can I do that would instead um, allow more to, uh, to uh, gain from, uh, from what I'm experiencing and what I'm, uh, what I'm getting? Another big bias is the cross-cultural bias. Um, cross-culture does not just apply to different uh, nationalities, um, but as you all know, uh, I'm sure, uh, you, we have it even in, in, uh, in our own environments. Whether it is, uh, he's from the South, I'm from the Northwest, he's from the Northeast, I'm from uh, Arizona. All of those are cultural biases. And anytime those cultural biases get in the way of good solid decision-making, anytime that we use it to justify a uh, kind of an instinctive response, a guttural uh, response, then we know that there's something wrong and that we need to be tackling it. Um, Cross-cultural biases apply to the fact that, and I'm hearing this a lot, um, in companies where I will hear things like, why is the IT team so stretched? And uh, why are our colleagues in sales not doing as much? Or vice versa. Why is the IT team getting so many perks right now uh, and us in sales are suffering because we don't even have the opportunity to go sell stuff? Anytime that you apply an us versus them in a kind of cultural context, you're probably being impacted by bias and not in a good way. 
pattern biases. Pattern biases are any time that we see a series of events follow through, like two plus two equals four. Sure. And any time that we see, for example, a series of events, um, I would dare to say um, that, for example, uh, parent biases have, um, have been uh, a downfall during this uh, uh, COVID-19 um, uh, response in the sense that the minute, for example, we saw that um, the, the numbers were going down, we just said, oh, let's reopen everything. It means that the virus is, uh, is coming down. Anytime that you want to see a reality through a lens that you've seen it before, but you're really, again, applying it to new situations, I think that there's something wrong and that's, uh, and then again, I would uh, invite you to check for your biases and to think through. Social. Social biases are especially pre pre prevalent when we are working in virtual teams. Um, there's a, there's reassurance in following the same patterns and following the same social uh, engagements that we had before. And yet, one thing that I'm sure some of you have experienced is that people that were maybe not that great in a face-to-face -face environment have become really effective in a virtual environment and vice versa. So to think that my social dynamics stay the same in an environment that's changing, um, that for example, the people that I go to and that I rely on are the same experts that can help me in a virtual environment, Things are different and you have access to different kinds of resources and different pools of talent. So extending out and reaching out for others can be really helpful. Stability and anchoring. So many of us are right now challenged with, uh, with that. So many of us would like to go back to how things were and we're still anchored in that. So when you're thinking of a virtual environment, again, ask yourself, Am I longing for how things were and not realizing that I need to shift? Um, action bias. Um, there's plenty of uh, uh, superheroes among us and plenty of uh, wannabe superheroes among us in the sense that when we see a problem, we just want to do something about it. Well, sometimes things don't work out that way. You need to take action only once you've had time to think about it. And uh, one little way to check and see if you have action bias in, uh, in your own life is think of uh, when you're buying, a, I don't know, a new uh, tech toy or a new piece of furniture. If you're the guy that reads the instructions first, you don't have an action bias. But if you're the person that gets the stuff out of the box and immediately wants to try and figure out uh, how it's going to work, let me reassure you, you have an action bias and you need to keep it in check. Last bias that I see uh, prevalent today in uh, tech teams, in, uh, sorry, in uh, virtual teams is also a technology bias. Um, given that we have to use so many remote uh, uh, ways of controlling our work environment, whether it's, uh, for example, for facilities people, um, the uh, remote AC systems or uh, anything that essentially has some kind of uh, advanced technology in it that, uh, that tells us how we're doing, there's a tendency not to believe your own instincts and to think that technology is giving you the right answer. Uh, the example that I tend to give here in a situation of crisis is the uh, BP Horizon platform that exploded um, about a decade ago in the Gulf of Mexico. The engineers on the platform could smell gas could tell that there was rattling of pipes, that there was something uh, going on uh, underground, and they chose to ignore that and instead relied on what the instruments were saying uh, of what was going on and ultimately that led to, uh, to an explosion. Let's shift on people. So we've talked about structures, we've talked about the biases, it's time to talk about people. Now that you understand your biases, I think it's important that you think through people and their perspective, the perspective that they bring at work and the perspective that you bring at work. So one thing that I would like to, for you to do is uh, 
and it ties to uh, the point around structures and how we're creating an environment that is different from uh, uh, from the um, uh, traditional environment that we were in. You need to be thinking about your team's resilience factor, uh, and you should be inventory that. Um, different people will be at different levels of confidence at this point in time. Some, um, I'm thinking of Nancy, are uh, resilient, they're able to, uh, to kind of uh, uh, cope with the uncertainty. For others, their confidence is shook. They don't even know if they're going to have a job. Um, uh, um, their significant other may be, uh, may be um, struggling with employment right now. Um, so think through what is their confidence level? How well do they, how good do they feel about themselves and their ability to overcome the challenges that we're facing? Also, we all know that being disciplined is um, a sign of resilience. Uh, being able to get up in the morning and still be structured um, helps you. So think through how your uh, teams are coping uh, with uh, um, and staying disciplined with the work that needs to be done. And the last part is support. Unless we have really strong support networks, it's really hard for us to cope. And asking yourself whether your team members have, for example, good families that support them, or whether, for example, they need uh, maybe their uh, team members support. Think through that and ask yourself, what is the resilience overall? And once you've done that, your next job should be, how do I help increase the resilience factor for my team? One way that you can do it is by fostering resilience-oriented conversations. So one of the things that's really difficult at times like this, and we are hearing that, that from, uh, from many in, um, uh, in uh, leadership positions, is having a, an honest conversation with your direct reports where you ask them how they're doing. Uh, they may be scared. They may not want to tell you that, they are, uh, um, that they're having sleepless nights in case they become a potential target for, uh, um, uh, for furlough or for, uh, for uh, being let go. So instead of trying to do just by yourself, Make sure that your team members peer up and uh, go through a guided conversation. What does a guided conversation look like? A guided conversation is a conversation where they have some form of document that helps them think through um, what successes they've had, um, how they have been coping with some of the challenges, what have they learned over the previous days, so that you can help them see the positive in things as opposed to just the negative and uh, kind of the emergency and uh, triaging of, uh, of their work life. If you um, are interested in, uh, uh, in uh, what a guided conversation document may look like, uh, feel free to reach out uh, at, at any time and I'll be happy to, uh, to point you to good resources. Ask empowering questions. Um, too often, I think that um, when we are engaging others, we're reliant on uh, uh, them answering with a yes or no, and it's more about task-oriented at times of triaging, as opposed to mm -hmm. having them uh, think through how they, um, uh, how they can control the environment that, that they're in, how they can manage the, uh, the work that they're in. And so, um, what we tend to do um, in, uh, in times of uh, turbulence or crisis is to go to a place where we want to be in control of everything. This is the time to empower others to manage the reality as well. It's not just you that need control. Everyone does. So good questions are, you're facing this challenge. Who on your team or within your organization or within your network may be able to help you? Instead of uh, trying to provide an answer or uh, being scared that they may screw things up, have them think through how they would approach a problem. And the last suggestion when it comes to uh, managing people is, um, and it's really focused on uh, giving them a different perspective, it's find learning opportunities. 
Resilience grows when people view their unsuccessful experiences as a learning opportunity rather than a string of failures. One thing that we can definitely say is that with COVID, we're all blessed with plenty of unsuccessful experiences. How we frame it and how we help people see what they learn through it is a critical component of enhancing their resilience, especially when we don't have the opportunity to be face to face, especially when our silence, for example, given that we cannot be online all the time, our silence can be interpreted as disappointment, you know, censorship, um, all of those negative emotions that when we don't get feedback, we're more likely to go into, especially given the context that we're in where so many bad things are happening. So think it through instead, and that's the part that I wanna leave you with. Uh, my recommendation is, to think it through with uh, what I would call a growth mindset. We're all learning, we're all growing through this. There will be hope, um, there will be success at the end of this. Thinking through with that mindset as opposed to the mindset of everything is gonna fail is certainly more productive and it certainly helps at a time when we're all um, in our own little bubble and uh, not being able to connect with others makes matter worse. I'm gonna stop there and I'm going to uh, leave a few minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, if you're interested in uh, what I'm hearing other organizations do, uh, if you have any uh, practical questions that you have on how to manage teams uh, virtually, the scope of the session was not on uh, necessarily on uh, what tools to use or uh, what times work best for conversations, but if you have really tactical questions, happy to answer those because the research that I've been doing um, has, um, has also highlighted some of this stuff. Um, Liz, um, examples of guided questions to touch base with my colleagues. Um, what if I do this, Liz? I will share with Robert a, um, an example of a guided conversation uh, that he can uh, then uh, share with the group and uh, we can make it as a little tool that everyone can uh, can access. Yeah, Joe, that'll work. You can share that. With you. We'll post it to the bootcamp website with the content for this session. So you'll go to the bootcamp, find this session, click on it, and uh, it'll be one of the downloadable pieces of content. Excellent. Any other questions? Joe, what are some of the best practices you're seeing from a couple different companies? Um, if you could share those real quick. Sure, absolutely. One of the things that I'm seeing is that people are being really mindful of the, how many Zoom calls they have. And uh, uh, what, they're, what I'm seeing is uh, a lot more collaboration tools uh, being used to answer questions in the moment. So if you think through of uh, issues that you need tackled, um, right now, because it feels like every conversation needs to be uh, lined up because you never know when people are, uh, are um, uh, answering stuff or not answering as it may be the case. Uh, we all try to organize Zoom calls. Oh, I only need 15 minutes. And then by the time you log in, by the time you uh, get to, uh, to the point, every single time that immediacy gets lost if you're trying to arrange Zoom calls, so my recommendation would be to use some collaboration tools. Two examples at the two end of the spectrums, one that costs zero dollars, the other one that it's more expensive and you may have in your organization. So in uh, Microsoft Teams, for example, use uh, channels uh, to have multiple conversations at once on different topics. You can't do that if you don't have it, if it's too expensive, use WhatsApp. Super easy. I see used a lot in, uh, uh, I'm gonna call them strappy organizations in Southeast Asia, where they cre actually create topics and people chime in on those topics. Whether it is, for example, um, uh, it's uh, John's birthday next week. Um, how do we, um, uh, how do I, uh, how do we celebrate it? Or if it is instead, uh, something about uh, schedule for next week on who's gonna go in the office. 
there are multiple things that they do that uh, multiple channels that they run where you can opt in and out even in a WhatsApp format. So that's pretty straightforward. I hope that answers your questions, Robert. Yes. So we have a, another question from uh, Raymond out there. It says, is the meeting available to review later? Um, there are some things I'd like to review. Yes, it is, Raymond. Uh, we are recording it and we will post it along with the tools on the bootcamp website. I left that link in the chat at the very beginning of the meeting. Uh, so you can find the link there. Um, so we will have this information available. And I'm noticing in uh, the chat that uh, Nancy wanted me to repeat the name of the Microsoft Teams alternative. It's WhatsApp. It's uh, essentially, um, s several of you may have it on, uh, uh, on your phone. It's, uh, it's an app on, uh, on your phone. I think it's owned by Microsoft. And I am pretty sure also that it's um, uh, they, uh, that it has encryption and to-end encryption, so uh, it's a pretty secure, safe way of uh, of communicating. Um, one other thing that uh, um, uh, that I wanted to mention before I go, if I may, uh, Robert, yes, is that uh, I am running a new um, survey right now, um, and it's essentially asking people how their attitude towards leadership has changed and what leadership skills they feel are important um, as we go through COVID, but also uh, once COVID is over, what will be uh, important uh, from a leadership perspective and sort of ranking priorities on uh, things that we should do as leaders. I would like, if I may, share the link to the survey because uh, it would help me a lot in, um, uh, getting more uh, more data. Yeah, um, cool. I'm, uh, I'm aiming to have several thousand people, and so the the more I can get, the more uh, what I will be um, uh, what I will be uh, sharing will be statistically relevant. At the bottom of it, at the bottom of the survey, you can put in your email address if you want to get the uh, summary results, so you can stay on top also of what other people have said. I will share it in the chat. Um, and uh, I'll share it as a link. So as part of this, if you wouldn't mind opening the, the link and then going to, uh, to the survey and filling it in uh, your own uh, time, that's fine. It only takes three to four minutes. It's a really super short survey. So I'm not going to be asking you for a ton of time, but I would really appreciate it. Joe, can you reshare that to um, select all attendees as well? It only went to the panelists. Oh, yes. Give me one second. I will do that. There we go. Hopefully you all got it. And thank you, Robert, for uh, letting me do this. No problem. You know, Joe, we appreciate you coming on and sharing those are some real insightful things on, on working with the people in our teams uh, remotely. Uh, so I appreciate uh, that insight. Um, we'll leave the chat box open for those of you that want to click on that link that Joe shared. But Joe, uh, we appreciate it. Um, and Joe's been been on board with this bootcamp and bootcamp the resource collective since the beginning, and we appreciate his support and insight and, and helping access the tools and resources that the University of Arizona has uh, available and is willing to share with us and help help small businesses throughout the state. So thank you, Joe. Um, uh, thank you, Robert. Um, our courses are on uh, the SEA resources page as well. So feel free to peruse that as teams. Thank you, Robert. And we want to remind everybody about the sessions tomorrow, 9 a.m. Uh, you can register on our bootcamp website. Uh, and also, again, this is being this session is recorded and will be available uh, later today on the website for review uh, or for those that uh, didn't get a chance to see it. Um, or if you want somebody else to see it, you can share the link with them and they can access it later. So we appreciate that. And thank you everyone for your time. And we will see you tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank you, Joe.